Welcome to Kentuckiana Real Talk, hosted by Jeremy Ward. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe on the podcast provider of your choice and consider subscribing to the Jeremy Ward Team YouTube channel for more expert real estate insights. Now, let's start the show. Hello, it's Jeremy Ward with Ward Realty Services. Today, I have the pleasure to speak with Ethan Adams with Brookstone Financial. Thanks, Ethan. Jeremy. Appreciate you coming in today. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you do and, and why you got in the business, Ethan. Well, I'm a comprehensive financial planner, and we're going to talk about some differences and what that means in a few minutes. But I've always been passionate about saving and investing, you know, even when I was a kid. And I originally wanted to just sit behind a desk and analyze investments and construct portfolios. Then I realized, you know, as I got a little older, I'm much more of a people person. And so sitting in that type of environment is not for me. Right. And doing my research about how to get into the business, um, years and years ago, you would have brokers that would meet with their clients and go out and, and sell and bring in new clients. And they managed the portfolios uh, and spent their time doing that too. Well, now um, it, it, we've gravitated much more to spending our time with our clients on the planning process and you don't really go back and forth. So I'd say 25% of my time now is based on money management. And the other 75% of my time is based on planning, making sure your state planning documents are in order and things like that. So <clears throat> I had a motorcycle accident back in uh, mid-2013 or so. And uh, I, I had been you know, a serial entrepreneur and had owned a couple of construction companies and things like that. Well, I'm laying on the couch pretty much incapacitated <laughs> for, for about nine months. And I thought, if I'm going to do this, now's the time to do it because right. I've got the time. I can't focus on anything else um, just just to study. So um, that's how I got here. Um, started my career at Northwestern Mutual and um, fantastic company to work for. Um, they're really all just one big family, mm -hmm. you know, the advisors and employees. But I, I the bureaucratic red tape and, you know, push to do. I don't, I don't feel like I had the flexibility to serve my client's interest in their best interest. Right. Right. So, I, um, made the switch to Brookstone financial in 2016 and that's been home ever since. You know, it's, it's nice. Uh, I kind of have not the same background, but I can relate because I came from a corporate world, you know, working for Ford motor company and my life didn't really matter. It was a number. It was, you know, get stuff down the line versus, working in, in my own business as a family owned, you know, small local boutique. And we consider all of our people, our agents, our clients like family. And it just family. gives you so much more freedom to interact and do it the way you want to do it and be personable and, and you know, uh, not just have to follow that chart, how you have to do no. your clients. And so I can relate to that, man. And, you know, and I did work with, and even in real estate, I was with big franchises and same thing. I had to, you know, market the way they said I couldn't use this. I had to use that. And it just really took uh, took my ability away to be who I am for my clients. Sure. We both have to be compliant. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I, I understand in the real estate world, you've got the you know, real estate association, and then you've got state and federal laws that you have to abide mm -hmm. by. But then if you know that you're compliant with what you're doing, mm -hmm. then you need the flexibility to serve your clients outside of that in in the, in the best way possible, you know, most efficient and easiest way possible. And it's the same thing on the financial planning world. Um, I, I, I'm accountable to the state regulators mm -hmm. and at times uh, FINRA, federal federal regulators. But if I, as long as I'm compliant with them, I can do what I want to on the outside. Sure, and that kind of leads me into my second question. Uh, what's the what differ, differentiates you as a financial planner, say from a broker? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question because a lot of people see if if we met on an elevator in in Chicago downtown, and okay. you, you just happen to say, "Hey, man, how are you? Day going great. What do you do?" And I say, "Well, I'm a financial advisor." That conversation is pretty oh, pretty much over. Right. Uh, your mind, I would I would assume, just immediately goes to, "Okay, this guy trades stocks and bonds, mm -hmm. and and that's about it." Well, like I said, when I was looking at coming into this industry and doing my research years and years ago, you know, think of Wolf on Wall Street mm -hmm. and or um, uh, what's the name of the other movie with Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio? Oh, yeah. Well, that was Wolf. No, that was Wolf that on was Wall Wolf. Street. I was thinking about the Kirk Douglas one. Yes. Um, anyway, he's pounding the telephone all day long 
trying to find people to buy or say, buy this stock, sell that stock, that kind of thing. That that's a typical broker. Mm -hmm. And one of the other things we're going to talk about is, you know, compensation. Um, they're commission based, right. and so there's a lot of opportunity or gray area for abuse in client accounts because this every account time they buy more, <laughs> if every time they buy or sell something, it's transaction based. So, so it's a commission. I mean, every time you pull the trigger, um, on on the on the financial planning side, oh, and those guys, the licenses they carried were securities licenses, which I have too, but they don't entail any type of um, fiduciary responsibility. And we think of fiduciary, you guys have that responsibility yes. too. Um, doctors, lawyers, CPA, they're required by law, now whether they do it or not, it's a different story, right? right? They're required by law to put the client's interest ahead of theirs mm -hmm. all the time. And this product might pay more, but this product over here better suits their needs we're required to go this route. Sure. Um, and then again, the brokers don't do a whole lot of planning. So th they're not bringing a network and a team to the table. And I don't have anything bad to say. I'm just telling you where the industry, the yeah, yeah, where the industry's gravitated from and to and the benefits of that. Um, we want to look at things from a 10,000 foot view. Okay. And I don't care whether you're 21 and you just graduated college or finished high school and started your own business or you've got a job somewhere, it doesn't matter, or whether you're 65. We all ultimately want to retire one day, right? Yeah. Uh, in some capacity. Um, what do we want retirement to look like? So we have to paint this picture first. Then we back up and we say, okay, what do you have to work with? Do you have kids? Do you have dual income? Um, do you own, do you own real estate? Do you have assets already? Um, and then how are we going to step-by-step step systematically get to this picture in, right. in, in the future? And I use an analogy, uh, I teach tax planning seminars and I hold up a bag of puzzle pieces, like a jigsaw puzzle. And I ask the crowd, you know, this is a jigsaw puzzle. What's the most important piece in the, in the, in the puzzle? The last piece. Well, the last, <laughs> the la that, that, that's completion, right? The, la right? the last piece. But you hear the side pieces, mm -hmm. um, the frame, corner pieces, things like that. Well, I put it down, and then I hold up the box. And I said, I want to challenge you guys to think about the box, the picture being the most important piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, technically, you could put this together without right. knowing what the end result looks like. But I don't know why anybody would waste their time doing that. Well, those pieces make up everything that you're going to you you've saved for accumulated um uh, sacrificed for so let's say your social security or a pension if you were lucky enough to have one or real estate that you've accumulated um 401k ira all of those types of things well the difference between that puzzle that we purchased at walmart and your your picture is that we get to paint the picture and then we get to rearrange those puzzle pieces in the best way possible Gotcha. Whereas the, the the physical jigsaw puzzle, they'll only go together one way. Only one fit, right. So <clears throat> how do we put a plan together and then systematically step by step, how do we protect that plan along the way? And there's some other things involved, um, estate planning documents. There's a couple of documents that everybody should have, a financial power of attorney, um, a medical power of attorney, a living will, uh, that that's three, and then if you get into you know the more complicated and financial situation, trust some sort might might make sense. So back to my statement earlier, I spend probably seventy five percent of my time working with my clients on putting a plan together so that they know they're safe and they're comfortable, and then review along the way to make sure that we're still on track to get there. Uh, managing money is not the difficult part. You know, the, the plan is, is something that I'm trying to, uh, I'll be 50 in September. So this, it's getting really close. My runway is getting shorter and shorter, and shorter. And we, you know, when I was at Ford, I would invest into their test, be their 401k. And man, I didn't know much about stocks. Right. So I would just kind of put it in a Magellan or something, just kind of let it run. Uh, then I got into real estate and, uh, I've kind of converted some of that money into funds I could use to buy and sell real estate. So now, you know, 18 years down the road, I've got a ton of real estate and, 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 and some cash and I'm going, okay, how do I use these vehicles to retire at some point? 
And I'm at the point where I need to sit down with you or somebody and be like, well, I've got all this. I've got cash flow. I've got, you know, rentals and I've got equity. Can I retire? Like what, you know, sure. your question is going to be, well, how do you want to retire? Like, yeah, how, what do you what want do you to do? Like? And, and that's something that's on my mind right now is like, I got to get with you and sit down and get some sort of a plan. Cause I, in my mind, it's, you know, it's rental homes are going to pay this much a month, but I haven't really figured in like, okay, what about inflation and, and medical costs and these things that you guys know what to look out for. So uh, that, that excites me uh, to maybe get with you and work that plan out because I've got all the pieces of the puzzle. I just don't know what's the best way to put them in for tax savings and such for my retirement. Well, that's where I was going to go. You're familiar with a lot of the strategies for getting in and out of real estate investments. Mm -hmm. um, with 1031 like-kind exchanges, yeah. right? The government per permits you to take the proceeds of sale or the profit of an appreci uh, you know, appreciated piece of property. And if you roll it into another one, Within a certain amount of time, I think it's 180 days, isn't it? Yeah. You, you have to identify rules, it within like 45 90, days yeah, 45, or 90, 90 days. but then the transaction has to be complete, but then you can avoid the taxes. And really, that's how people that have built wealth in real estate continue to build it and avoid this taxes generation after generation after generation. Because the government will allow you to continue to do that, you know, with your kids. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we've got, you, you know, in, in the tax code, what we call step up in basis and um, an appreciated asset. That's for instance, not in your IRA or 401k when your heirs receive it, they can sell it the next day and they don't owe any taxes on it. Right. So, I mean, you bought a property for a hundred thousand dollars. It's appreciated to six. They can sell it and take the $500,000 gain and they don't owe the government anything. Right. It basically goes off your cost basis at time of death, you know, in our world. Correct. Us, you know, you're not going to pay if there is tax, it has to be paid. It's only on what it's worth the day, you know, anything over what you get the time of death, right? It wasn't what grandpa paid for it back in 1920. He paid $10 right. for it. Now it's worth 600000 You don't pay tax on that. But if he sold it, he would. If he sold it, he if would. If he sold it, he yes. would. So that's another consideration to make. And then if you go back to the estate planning conversation, let's say you've built a large portfolio of real estate. And yes, they, they can sell that. They could liquidate that okay. if they wanted to. And wouldn't realize any taxes, but if you don't have that structured properly, all that stuff's going to get hung up in probate. Yes. And there's a cost for that. Not only can they not do anything with it until it exits probate, but there's a cost to the state you'd have to give up. I don't know what that cost is in Indiana. Somewhere probably between three and six percent. Wow. So well, it, a big it, estate. That, that it's unnecessary. <laughs> well, right. So. In that sense, it, it makes sense to sit down with a financial planner, a CPA, and an estate planning attorney and protect, put those assets in a vehicle to where they will avoid probate. Right. No, 100% um, agree. And that applies for everything except your 401ks or IRAs. Right. Those, those are named beneficiaries and there is no probate. Nice. Nice to know. Yeah. Now, I, I will say, and we're probably getting too far, I'm probably getting too far into the weeds. But one of the other things that <clears throat> the SECURE Act changed in 2020 was you used to be able to decide you could take out the money from an inherited IRA or 401k, and it's based on your life expectancy. Okay. okay, so if your grandfather or your parents left it to you when they died and they were 80, right, you could choose to take it out over their life expectancy, and the table goes out to 100 or so. Or let's say you're 45 when that happened, you could stretch those distributions out over your life expectancy. So that means the distributions are a whole lot smaller and the tax consequence or implication is a whole lot smaller. Well, now they've removed that option. If you inherit an IRA and you're not a spouse, so a child or nephew or the next door neighbor, they have to deplete that account in a 10 year period. So they got to pull it out over 10 years. All of it. And they have to start in, in the year after you died. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's look at an example. Let's say there's, there's parents leave a million dollar portfolio and they've got, they got one child and that child is married and they're making $200,000 a year. You just added a hundred thousand dollars to their ordinary income. Every year. Just move their so you up. took them from 200 to 300 and moved them from the 22% tax bracket to the 36. Right. 
there's ways to avoid those things. Yeah. And that's, that's the, that's the thing I've noticed just from being a say assembly line worker, which I was to getting into business and learning as I go over the last 20 years, man, if you don't know, if you don't have a good team around you, you have a good tax account, a good financial planner, you know, you got the good attorneys, you're just going to blow all your money. You make almost going to go back in taxes. I mean, sure. I, I noticed the difference between, you know, having uh, a CPA that was working for me that, you know, um, I mean, I think he did a good job, but maybe he wasn't uh, using all the benefits or the write-offs that was there to to get in with a guy that focuses on real estate, uh, CPA. Right. And all of a sudden, I'm getting, uh, you know, all these tax breaks that I didn't even know existed, but it was about having the right people on the job. Sure. And it's made a huge difference. So I could definitely see where if you and I could sit down and look at what kind of what I've got going on, you kind of help me put that puzzle together. It'd be yeah. super beneficial, not even for me, but for my for my kids and, and, yeah, and we'll, the legacy, right? <laughs> well, that's what's important. You're accumulating these things for, for yourself to fund your own retirement mm -hmm. and because you enjoy it. But at some point, they're going to transition to somebody else, yeah. the next generation, your heirs or, you know, whatnot. But back to being compliant, I do have to say, I got, I got to make a disclosure um, that, that this should not be construed as financial advice right? because everybody's situation is different. Mm -hmm. And for the listeners... Uh, we encourage you, you know, to 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 find a team member um, and and seek that advice because everybody's situation is different. Yeah, everybody's going to be a little different. And you got to find your team that fits you. Yeah. And so, no. So, what's the difference uh, between a fee based only advisor and a transaction based advisor? You touched on a little bit about the commissions, right? But what's what's the really the biggest difference between those two? Okay, so if we go back to the the in the days past where you had, you know, brokers and, and some people did this, they had team, they'd build a team with an mm -hmm. estate plan attorney and a CPA, but for the most part, they just operated on money management. And it was based on, you know, how much can I make your money grow? There weren't any, there wasn't any focus on, you know, uh, what bucket does that money need to be in? So Seth likes to say, it's not what you have, it's what you get to keep. Yep. And again, we're talking about tax implications. So now gravitate over to, you know, a fiduciary financial planner. We charge a fee based on the assets that we manage. Sure. That's it. All of that other work that we put in, all of those meetings, office staff time, whatever the case may be. And I usually attend all of my clients' CPA meetings yeah. and estate planning meetings. All, all of them. I sit at the table because I learned really quick. One, I want to be involved. But then two, 99% of the time I've done that, something came out in that meeting that would not have come out had I not been sitting there. Right. Client forgot to tell, tell the attorney. Attorney didn't know to ask the question. So <clears throat> we charge a fee based on your assets. So let's say someone's got $500,000 and we charge one and a half percent on an annual basis. Um, if you're investments grow, I make more money. Mm -hmm. um, and then that fee covers all of that work and that's that awesome. relationship m moving forward. Um, so that's really the, the, well, that's how we operate. Then commission based is, um, I'm trying not to name names. Mm -hmm. um, every time they buy or sell something in your portfolio, there's a commission. Um, so we have something called a share mutual funds that we don't use. And there's what's called a load up front. So if you brought me $100,000 or you brought $100,000 to, to a commission-based broker and he put you in an A-share mutual fund, your statement's going to say 95, not 100, because you're going to give up five grand for moving it, it. It, it, <laughs> when he purchased it, he or she purchased it. Well, on top of that, there's internal fees and inside, management fees inside those mutual funds. So it could be anywhere from... 0.65, 65 basis points to, to one and a quarter. So in year one, you got to earn 7% just to break even. If you got a down year, the next year you got to earn twice that. Right. So it's just not efficient. No. And then it can't be rebalanced without, without that 5% load again. So basically they just take the dividends and buy more of it and they leave you in the same fund from the time you're 30 to the time you're 65. It just, it's not an efficient way to go about it. No, things. and I think, I mean, just as me sitting on the other side of the table, I, I totally agree. Like, 
if you're charging me a flat fee based on what I've got, it's it's my benefit that you make me more as well as it's your benefit too. Because as that as my wealth goes up and my value goes up, so does your check basically. Sure. So versus just how many times can I move this guy's money to make a commission, you know? And that they call it churning in the industry. Churning. And when you go through and you have to take the 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 exam that I took is actually called the Uniform Investment Advisors Law Exam. And it takes about six to eight hours. I mean, you're sitting wow. in, in an exam situation for, well, you know that because the broker exam's ridiculous. The, right. the real estate agent exam is not near as onerous and, and, and detailed, but that broker exam is, 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 is it's, a it's changed the game, you know, from, uh, from the time I got in, you just take the agent class twice to become a broker, right? Now you actually take a broker class well, yeah. and then a managing broker class and, and test the test. And so it's, it's, it's been a good change for our business yeah. for sure. Um, but back to the fees. So if, if we're using equities only, so let's just say we don't use a whole lot of bonds. Um, there's other ways to create that safety and fixed income. But so let's just say just a pure stock account, Johnson and Johnson, Exxon Mobil, whatever, whatever, you know, um, there's no transaction fees. So when you leave our office, we have what's called an IAA, Investment Advisory Agreement. And it shows what your fee is based on, you know, what we've negotiated. You have to see that fee and sign your name under it. There's a paragraph that tells you exactly how I get paid and for what I'm doing, right? Yes. I can't tell you how many times I see people come out of that brokerage world and they don't know what they're paying. They're not, they're not required to disclose that to you unless you ask. If you ask, they have to tell you, but a lot of people just don't know. Um, and back to your point about the more money I make, the, the more money you make, the more money I make. When we've put a plan together, if we've done the math and it says, okay, we need to earn long-term, let's just say 6%. We need a 6% return on our investment to get you what you said you wanted. Mathematically, I can tell you that, right? Mm -hmm. So we build the plan and then we back up and do the math. Why am I taking the risk to earn you 12 if I gave you exactly what you said you wanted and I'm only taking the risk to earn you six? There's no reason to do that. Right. We're going to do better than that, but we don't have to go out of the way to try to hit a home run. Put you in a risky position. Put you in a more risky position when, again, we're on track to meet your goal with minimized risk. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, there's a lot of similarities, I think, in our businesses. Uh, you talked about the disclosure. You know, when we sell uh, a person's home or a buyer's buying a home, there's a disclosure that goes out three days prior to we can close. And if that disclosure is not signed by that buyer or seller, well, the buyer on the loan side, uh, it would be the buyer that has to, to, to see the disclosure, what they're spending, what they're being charged. What I mean, everything's on there. Sure. And they sign it three days before they even go to closing. If that's not signed, we can't close. But I think it's great. Like, it used to not be that way. You just showed up at closing. Hopefully, your agent had went over everything. I was like, here you go. That's good to sign. Yeah. Now, they're they're making sure of it. And that's because of 2008 and everything we went through. Um, so, now we got respite at watches out for us. Same way, uh, it's kind of how we approach uh, a seller. Uh, you know, what's your go? What's your timeline? You know, what do you, what do you think your home's worth? And then we go to work and we're, we're putting the math together. We're pulling the comps and saying, here's what we think it's worth. Is that good for you? Uh, and I'll tell my clients all the time, you know, here's my commission rate. And, uh, you know, we disclose that. And then it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, look, man, you might think your home's worth 500,000, but from the comps I'm pulling, it's worth 350 to four. Obviously I make more money if I can sell it for, you know, for 500,000. But you have to be realistic. But I, gotta tell be the client, realistic. <laughs> I don't think that we're going to get this out. Yes. So we can list it that way. And you created, you, you set a timeline that if mm -hmm. it doesn't sell, we then I'm going to have to come back and we're going to have to bring, you know, bring, bring the bring price down. down until we get some showings or, or, you know, exactly. some, some bites. And yeah, there are a lot of similarities because I was going to say your financial advisor typically would play the quarterback to this little team, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if you, everybody needs three, well, most people need three relationships. You need a relationship with an estate planning attorney sure. uh, in some capacity or another, even if it's just to draft your will, power of attorney, HIPAA form, all that kind of stuff, a CPA um, mm -hmm. most of the time, and a financial advisor. All three of those need to know what each one of them is doing or they can't advise you. Right. Uh, appropriately they gotta have the full picture 
Correct. And and most of the time, the attorneys do what you tell them to do. And that's there's not a whole lot of, you know, conversation and dialogue back and forth and, no. and what we would call fact finding. And CPAs are pretty much reactive. And I like to use the analogy, they're looking through the rearview mirror. You go at the, to the CPA at the end of the year and you hand them all these documents, um, 1099s that you received or what, you know, bills that you've paid from running your business and they tell you what the consequence is. Right, right. Okay, let's look through the windshield and 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 avoid making those things so that you don't have to clean them up at the end of the year. Absolutely. Always there's going to be something that, you know, when, when you file your tax, things like that. But that's a good example of working with, you know, a financial planner and the CPA because the planner knows he doesn't file your taxes, but he knows what you're doing during the year. So if the two of you, the, the two of those two relationships sit down together, then we can be proactive and say, okay, my client's doing this, or this is what I'm doing for my client. What is the implication? And the CPA can give me an answer, and then we can go back and maybe tweak things if we need to and avoid any of that at the end of the year. That was the conversation I'd have with my previous CPA and I have to take a little bit of the blame because I didn't have a financial uh, planner kind of forecasting. Here's what the steps you need to take. Uh, you know, the tax guy saying, yeah, that works for me and this and this and this, and that'll save you some money. I was just, like you said, you know, a couple of questions maybe throughout the year, should I buy it or cash or try to get a loan or, you know, it's usually real estate questions. Sure, and yeah. then at the end of the year, I get hit with this big tax bill. I'm like, well, man, you didn't tell me that if I put it in an LLP, limited liability partnership, it would be better than an LLC. But that's where the financial planner and the attorney comes in. Kind right. of, here's what I want to accomplish. How do I get there? You guys kind of make that plan where, you know, as you said, I was going at the end of the year going, okay, here's what I did. Where'd I mess up? Yeah. <laughs> so oh, you're I, right. I'm learning. Yeah. Like, you got to have these partners around you to help advise you going forward rather than trying to fix what you've done previously yeah. here. And, and I would encourage younger generations, well, even mine. I mean, I'm, I'm in my early 40s. But folks that are working, you know, put a plan together. And I see a lot of retirees, people that are approaching retirement, you know, 60, 62, 3, whatever. And um, they've saved and they've done well, but they could have done better and been more efficient. Mm -hmm. And so now it's not a problem. They've got the money to retire, but we're having to clean things up. Yeah. I see people that have moved around, you know, different states and work for different companies and they've got two or three different 401ks and two or three different IRAs with two or three different places. And so all those things can be put in one account and you don't need two different IRAs to be diversified. Right. You can do it all in one bucket. Um, and when we talk about buckets, we talk about, I'm talking about tax buckets. So there's different places to put money where that money is taxed in different ways. Yeah. But back to your point, you play the quarterback on the team, too, because if you've got someone that comes to you, like, let's say, a buyer, and they don't have a mortgage broker, you have those relationships mm -hmm. that you can say, look, you can use whatever mortgage broker you want, or you can go down to your local bank. I wouldn't recommend that. Um, and that's another conversation for another day. I just think they're they're Actually, you can compare that between the broker and the mm -hmm. uh, fiduciary planner that's independent the options are endless. There's 25, 30 different products out there to suit your need the best. Right. Whereas you go down to L and N or wherever, <laughs> and you, they've got two products that that's provided from corporate, and then that's pretty much it. Right. But so, <clears throat> buyer comes to you, they don't have a mortgage broker. You say, okay, this is who I work with. This is what I would suggest that mortgage broker is going to look at their income and their debt to equity ratio and things like that and say, okay, well, we've approved you for $300,000 based on your cash flow and your income. <clears throat> so then that's where you start looking. I mean, that's the starting mm -hmm. point for where, you know, where, where we're starting to look for a house. Now bring myself into the situation. The mortgage broker said the company, the lender is willing to loan you this based on your cash flow. But does spending that twenty two hundred bucks a month on a mortgage make sense for you right. and your financial plan? Because if you're not saving in other areas, then you're putting you know most people put about thirty percent of their income in their in their uh, primary residence. Mm -hmm. That's usually Absolutely. where that I mean that's about the number. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I mean that's 
So it's one of their bigger investments. Does does taking that twenty two hundred dollars out of your income because the mortgage company says you can afford this size of a house really make sense? And are we going to be able to get to the end picture your go. if you're using all of that money? I right. guess I'm, I'm confusing things or, well, or, or I rambling. Well, what you're but... saying. And, and so it's like with my conversation with them is, you know, okay, I've talked to my financial blind, uh, advisor. Yeah, I'm approved for the 300000 I can spend the $2,200. But he doesn't feel like that's going to get me to my goal for retirement. And then I can say, well, what have you thought about this? What if you bought a duplex, say, and you lived in one side of it and it's, you know, it's twenty two hundred dollars for both, so three hundred thousand uh, dollars duplex. But you live in one side of it, and the other side you rent out for fifteen hundred dollars a month. Now you're only spending six hundred a month on your housing. Right? How's that sound with your financial planner? And the remainder of that money is now going towards retirement. Right. Right. So you know, if we can, as you said, quarterback and pass back and forth between your team, man, you could come up with some really strong plans. And that's something I'm talking to my daughter about, who's eighteen; she'll be nineteen this month. Is like, you know, she's talking about going out and buying her first home. I thought, well, honey, you don't need a home. You're living with me. How about you go out and you buy your first investment property? And then you let it pay for itself, right? And then you build equity. Then maybe by that time you do buy your home or you buy another one. You know, there's there's so many ways to 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 skin the cat. But at the end of the day, you got to know where you're heading. You got to have that go. And you got to have a plan to get there. Well, I know we've talked about a lot today. For any of you guys that want to take that puzzle and have a planner help put it together, I recommend you get a hold of Ethan. Ethan, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, I guess call the office. Um, our phone number is 812-288-9000. Uh, you can email me at eadams at brookstonefinancial.com. Ethan, we really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us today. On. Uh, look forward to seeing you again, and maybe we'll we'll do some more uh, when we sit down. Maybe we can come up with some topics that uh, we can share with our viewers that give them a little little push in life. No, that sounds good. I love it. All right, I've started doing radio, so this is this is this has been fun. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. For more local real estate information, please like and subscribe to the Jeremy Ward Team YouTube channel.